Hey, what's going on, everyone? This is Ricardo Bilazar. Another lesson, another week. I want to make sure we do the most we can with the time we have. So I'm excited to come to you again. It's another beautiful Thursday. Um, and yeah, we got some stuff I want to unpack today on top of finishing what we talked about last time, which is actually doing some basic commands in Windows. These are some commands I think uh, everyone should know uh, if you're going to do any level of administration within Windows. I mean, honestly, if you're just using Windows, these are really good commands to have under your belt and know how to operate. And uh, that being said, it is uh, important to me that I show you these things because I've had experiences where it was, uh, I would say it was, it was unfortunate that some people I worked with in the past uh, did not know how to do this, and it caused some conflicts or it caused some delays in delivery of some of our materials. But I mean, not real conflicts, honestly. It's just little roadblocks that we got through. But yeah, I just want to make sure we all get a basic understanding. Oh, sorry, forgot that light was on. Um, but anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and get into it. First, as always, we're going to do a quick recap of what we covered last time. And basically on the last session that we had, we talked about how to do win event logs. And that basically is how do we check logs within Windows? What kind of logs exist? And most of all, we did it using PowerShell, command line interface. At the end of the day, look, at the end of all these lessons and sessions, if you follow along with me, I'm hoping that uh, if nothing else, you get from this a level of comfort that uh, th that allows the rest of your career in the tech industry to, to just float right by. You know, once you're comfortable with command line, I believe it opens up a whole nother way of viewing operating systems, period. Not just Windows, just, uh, uh, Linux, Mac, Unix, any of those, right? So that's what we did last time. We did PowerShell, did how to pull down, uh, how to pull and filter and search through event logs, which I thought was really cool, learned it together. As I told you last time, uh, my brother CJ told me, hey, uh, I don't wanna sit here and watch you do something you've already practiced and run through before. So last time was one of those instances where there was no practice at all. It took the entire hour and a half to get to a, a good point where everyone, uh, where I hope that everyone was able to take something away and actually get their own log, uh, Windows logs used. All right, so. That being said, that's what we did last time. What are we going to do today? Well, uh, if I, if you're new and you haven't heard yet, I had a change in my role during my day job. And because of that, it um, I am now um, experiencing new things I haven't had experience with in the corporate environment. And I am currently on the incident response team. And it's been really interesting, put it that way. But there was one case in particular that really stood out to me. I thought it was really cool, and I wanted to walk through it with you before we get into the commands on how to navigate Windows. So I'll tell you right now, basically the case is, if you've ever worked in a corporate environment, majority of the times, if you're using a uh, enterprise managed asset, so that's your laptop they provide you, or even if you're in a place you do desktops. Right? I work in a lot of financial industries, so uh, I work for a lot of financial com companies in the financial industry, and uh, a lot of them do trading, and usually a trader, a trading desk will have a lot of desktop machines. So, but anyway, any of these managed assets will have policy set, like the policy we've gone over in previous videos, right? So it has these policies and it stops you from actually being able to install certain software. And it's really cool to think about, right? We can protect all of our desktops, all of our resources in our, in, in our enterprise environment, and even on our local machines with the help of previous videos, you now know how to set some of the policies. Uh, but we could protect it, we could protect, take our protection a little step further and um, block non-administrative users from installing software. Now, that being said, there are some situations where software is a little more, not even difficult to block, it's just that um, there are ways to not just install but run, but uh, install and run software without 
having administrative rights, even in an environment that you are not supposed to be able to do so. Now, I will say whatever I'm showing you uh, today, I don't encourage anyone to do it on your work computer, your company provided asset. Uh, you can always do a virtual machine. If you miss anything about setting up a virtual machine, you can always go back to our previous lessons uh, for virtualization, where uh, the steps we go through for installing the CentOS can be applied to any operating system. And um, there's even a blog about how to install Windows 11, which there's an issue installing on VirtualBox anyway. So all that is there for you if you want to practice on your own machine. So make sure you do that, right? Get some practice in. Never do this kind of stuff on your work computer. All right, so that being said, I explained the situation. We had a user that wanted to install a piece of software that would normally have been blocked, and they tried to install. We were able to stop it through other uh, mitigating factors, but the fact of the matter is this does exist, and it does work out in the wild, and this does go for Windows 10, 11, all of recent versions. So if you're – let's go over to our – Let's go over to our browser over here. Oh, wrong screen. Let's flip over here. All right, so what I am talking about is we're going to do a simple Google search, okay? So we're just going to do Google, and this search is going to be install software without uh, admin rights. And it's kind of right up Windows 10, right? Um, let me see if I can find... Let's go with this one. Let's see what happens. I feel like it's a different article I read. All right, so I'm checking on this. All right, cool. All right, this actually may be a good one as well. Man, I hate all these pop-ups on these, on these blogs. All right, but hey, it is what it is. So give me one moment. I'm just going to check to see. All right, so how do I force uh, local admin rights in Windows 10? That was a question being asked. What I'm looking for is a solution down here, which this article does not have the written solution. This is a video, so it's not the one I've used before. And I don't think this one – oh, yeah, this is this is what I'm looking for. Okay, so basically one thing I want to be very clear about, this at no time is actually subverting – or elevating your rights, right? It's not subverting the, subverting the system. It's not a hack. I mean, I guess it is a hack, but it's not like a malicious uh, intended hack, and it's not you elevating your rights and you can apply it to any and everything. Basically, the way this works is there is a feature in Windows that we'll talk about in just a moment, but basically applies certain parameters based on the user executing and that is the UAC, User Access Control, I think is what it stands for. But it's a feature built into Windows, I think since Windows, I want to say 2000. Uh, and that might be after that, I mean Windows 7. It's been Windows 2000, Windows 7, they had UAC involved. Um, but anyway, so basically what happens is to, sub to not subvert, but to allow yourself to install and run an application you should not be able to do so without admin rights you just have to set a particular environment variable this is called a compact layer variable and you're setting it to run as invoker basically run as you versus trying to access uac to determine who to run it as and we'll look at the uac in just a moment and then after that we start setup now if you're not familiar there is a language, a scripting language in Windows called Batch, right? It's a Batch file is what it's called. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Bat file. Um, and this Bat file is can be run as an, a, an application. So what we do is we create a Bat file, we run the file, and it executes everything for us, whatever we put in those lines. It goes from top to bottom in the file. It executes the first line, goes to the next line, and it runs it for you. Now, because in this particular case, we're setting an environment variable that allows us to look beyond who we are and just who, I mean, look beyond the, the UAC and just focus on who you are executing. 
this variable is executed, then it actually allows you to install a piece of software. All right, so let's look at what a UAC is. Well, actually, probably better to look at what this is first, right? This variable. So I'm going to capture this. Let's put it into another search. Bam. You know, I just thought about something. Give me one second. I have to get my... In fact, I will bring this screen back over. Let me move this over. Move workspace to the left. There we go. All right, so let's see if we get on the return on this. Um, so what does it actually do? So I love Stack Overflow. You can always read that one. Found a user bypassing admin with command min c set. And it talks about that as well. So yeah, a couple articles. Me personally, I always go to Stack Overflow first. A lot of times use it as a descriptor developer, but it's just a great source for a lot of to get access to a lot of educated people in certain areas. So this is an extension of the original command we put in and we saw in the article. It has a couple more parameters to it. So this person is asking, what does it do? Um, so this is what we end up getting. It says it's a system environment variable, like we said before, right? So system wide and it allows you to set a compatib uh, compatibility layers. So that's what compat stands for, I guess, compatibility, uh, which settings allow you to just right click on an executable, select properties. So basically saying you can set it yourself directly on any executable, any application, uh, EXE, MSI, I believe, will also do it. And then they give a couple options. Now there are more options here, just so you see. And actually that one didn't work. Wouldn't you believe it? Um, but either way, so I thought it was really cool when they said you guys should do multiple options. So you could tell run a program in compatibility mode from Windows 98. So these settings persist as long as a, a variable exists. The variable stops existing when either the com command prompt which in which the com uh, variable was set is closed or when variable is manually unset uh, with the command set and then put a e uh, blank equal sign. Okay, well, that's pretty cool. I never knew that's how you unset a variable. So, this one is just a little more feedback to it. But I think that's a pretty good explanation. That's how this particular variable works. It's compatibility mode. It allows you to uh, change that particular variable. And then, what was I thinking about? The UAC. Let's go here. All right, yeah, user account control. That's what it is. Okay. In fact, let's see. I want to see how compact. Let me see. Compatibility matrix. Um, oh, well, it adds it in there, so I guess it talks about compatibility. Okay, so UAC processing and interactions. Each app that requires administrative access token must prompt for consent. The one exception is the relationship that exists between parent and child processes. Child processes inherit the user's access token from the parent process. Both the parent um, and child process, however, must have the same integrity level. So I think that's an important fact here, integrity level, okay? A high integrity application is one that performs tasks that modify system data such as a disk partitioning application, while a low integrity uh, application is one that performs tasks that could potentially compromise the operating system, such as a web browser. So that's good to understand. So are we doing something that modifies at the system level? Or are we doing something that is kind of superficial and only for that, and can be seen as only for that particular user at that time, right? So it breaks down the log on process, uh, user experience. This is a consent prompt that we are all pretty much uh, familiar with, right? So do you want to proceed? Do you want to allow the following program to make changes to this computer? Okay. And then this is like if you have to put in a password because you are, uh, you need elevated rights. So let's go and see if I can search for a compact. 
looks like there's one found, one of eight. The app compat database stores information in the application compatibility fixed entries for an application. So it's kind of interesting, right? We just noticed that up here, this is about changing the compatibility for execution, right? And like I said, UAC is what is interacting with in Windows. Now I guess that's kind of supported when you look at the app compat right here. So that variable we just looked at interacts with a particular feature app compat, the database that stores application compatibility. Now, I don't know who figured out that if you change the compatibility that it will run the applications. I'm just showing you where you can read a little further into this, I, I will say. Um, let's see. Do they have compatibility? All right. Support 32-bit, non-elevated 64-bit apps simply receive an access denied message when they attempt to ha acquire a handle, a unique identifier to a Windows object. So native 64-bit apps are required to be compatible with UAC and to write data into correct locations. Um, let me see if I can find where run as invoker is a compat option. Let me see. Actually, I want to see how does UAC a secret or even higher UAC. I think this is what we're looking for right here. How to disable UAC prompts. Ha. Huh. So this goes in more detail as to, so this is kind of some of the research that I would normally spend some time doing to look into this. And one thing about it, working in incident response is it's a constant learning and it's, a con it's an environment of constant learning, right? We have to constantly understand how certain components work in an operating system or application so we can figure out how to monitor for it indicator of comp indication um, iocs indicators of compromise is something we have to continuously put together uh, so we know how to identify what application we can use to to, to assist with building a solution down the line um, so how to disable us uac prompt okay and let's see if we can jump right to where run as invoker. Yeah, here it is. The run as invoker flag allows you to run the application with a marker inherited from the parent process. This cancels the processing of the application manifest and uh, the discovery of the installer process. This parameter does not provide administrative privileges, but only bypasses UAC prompt, right? So you're not elevating yourself, as I said before, you're just going around a different way right you're going around the door you're going through the window instead of through the door in this case and that's what setting that particular environment variable allows you to do when running as this and if you remember what we just read about uac there's a relationship between the parent and the child process and it seems like this flag particularly uh allows you to inherit so pretty much you're um you're telling to ignore any the child portion of it and just look at the parent level process right so that is what is stating here disabling uac for a program using applicant application compatibility tool so this one run this exe file and during installation of program means internet access select only the application compatibility tool item microsoft application compatibility tool is a free set of tools to fix app compatibility issues when mitigate uh, when migrating to the new windows version i think that's pretty cool i don't think we need that as a quick hack to run your preferred application on your machine but this is something i wanted to point out to y'all so this is something that came up this past week uh how people are looking to subvert and work around restrictions of installing applications uh typically you have to have administrative rights to do so but with this particular built-in feature of windows right uh it's a built-in in uh variables a built-in concept of uac uh is meant to protect the system and to and uh to i guess impact uh make sure compatibility is there but when you really look at everything be, once you learn more about this system like i said before you can find ways to get around those things that you're trying to do um 
so now this is giving a way to to do that. Um, so now you can actually install so software without being an administrator. And like I said, don't do it at work, please. Uh, work on it at your own home in your own lab. But yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Just Google it, and in fact, there is this right here if you want to practice if it works the way you expect it to. This is a link. Uh, it says Windows 7, but I'm pretty sure it applies to any of them. I'm going to put this in the chat. This is a link that you can um, look at to learn how to block users from running programs that you don't want them to do so, right, or require administrative privileges to do so. If you look at this, this is, um, let me see, this is a local group policy editor. So we've done this before. We walked through group policy when we disabled the, um, what is it, when we disabled the task manager. We've done this already once before. Um, all right, so let's go ahead. So that being done, let's go and jump into what we actually want to get done today. Oh, quick update. So I did receive all the components for the server I brought up before. So I am looking to do that next Thursday, actually build out the server that will be uh, supporting all of our future builds, virt virt virtual machines, okay? So we're going to build a server that's going to run um, virtual machines for everyone to be used and um in all our future videos okay all right so have a good night son all right let's see here yeah i got i got a couple things open let me go and close this out and What are we going to do now? We're going to bring up our Windows box, which is this right here. And we are going to, let's see. Oh, you know what? So let's start up here. Before we go into how to use the command prompt, basic terms or uh, basic commands, first of all, there are more. there's more than one way to open your command prompt. Okay, and I'm talking about not just through the search bar, not just using the uh, the window search. I mean, uh, you also have an alternative route. So I want to show that to you first. And the what the the, the less known version, I guess I'll do f uh, do first is how do you open up command prompt from your Windows Explorer? So this is the file explorer. I mean, so from file explorer, there is a shortcut that anyone can use, whether you're admin or not, to mo open up command prompt. Now, open it as an administrator, I'm not sure how that part works. I think you still have to go through the typical menu, search for command prompt, and then right click and do administrator, run as administrator. But for this purpose, just opening command prompt from your file explorer is actually really cool and really, really nifty trick. And the reason why I say it's really cool is because say you're you're not comfortable yet traversing the different directories so going from one directory to another and you still are trying to get comfortable with the command line and uh you know where you want to navigate to from the gui side of things that we're doing now what you can do is you can navigate to the particular folder that you want to work with so if i want to go to pc c drive program files Let's say I want to go to Microsoft, whatever reason. Oh, Edge is in here, right? So what I could do is go to the directory, and don't worry about this. It'll type right over. Type CMD. It will automatically open up a command prompt at that specific location. I thought it was actually an awesome, awesome, cool you know, like trick to, to be able to do that instead of having to worry, to worry about how to navigate through command prompt over uh, from one directory to another. Uh, we're going to learn that today, but, you know, sometimes it's a little faster to use a little shortcut you have like this. All right, so that's how you do it that way. And then if I want to do it the standard way, just come over to CMD. This is command prompt. This is your command line interface, and it'll open right up. Now, this one 
always opens at the user uh, level. So whatever user you're signed in at, it will open up at your home directory for that user, which for me, touch the box. So this is my non-admin user, okay? All right, so from here, let's go and get started. What are some of the things you want to know when you're, work, when you're working on an operating system? Well, first of all, you want to always know uh, where you are, right? You want to know what directory you're in for whatever reason. Let's say you get confused and you're not, uh, and you don't remember, um, and you don't remember what this stands for, right? This is actually our current directory, but for whatever reason, let's say you're somewhere and you get confused or the prompt messes up. It has happened before. My prompt is blipped out and I just had like the little blinking cursor. But anyway, you can always do PWD and I'm thinking about Unix. So let me go over to my Google and let's see if I can um, how to get present working directory uh, Windows. I do Windows CMD. All right. Um, CMD command gets current working directory location. I'm not sure if that's what I'm looking for. Let's see what happens. So CD can be used to display the name or to change oh okay so it does work cd is how you do that okay so cd supposedly cd will give us the current working directory so we type in cd yes it does this is the same thing as pwd in unix this is how you get your current working directory so that's one thing to keep in mind another thing is how do you traverse from one directory to another well the same command cd stands for change directory, at least the way I learned it, right? Um, and do you remember that way? So CD, change directory. So you're going to change what directory you're in. But what directory can I change to is the next question. Before I do CD, I guess the best thing to do is the DIR, which is directory, right? It lists out whatever directory are available. So from the current directory I'm on, in my C drive under users, under tester Bob, these are all the directories, which are also synonymous with folders. Um, so these are all my folders that I have available to me. I can change into. So let's say, for instance, you know, you see my stuff on my desktop. I got the goodies folder. I got the Sam One System One. If I go into CD Desktop, Enter. Now. Do the same command we did earlier, DIR, to list it out. What you can find is goodies are listed here for directories. Now, I know I have. Oh, also I have Sam. I also have Sam One System One. Now the rest of these are the reason why you probably ask yourself. Well, why don't you see Microsoft Edge? Why don't you see Oracle VM VirtualBox or Recycling Bin? Well, the reason why these don't show up here is because they're not actual files or directories. Those are links. Those are shortcuts to other locations. So they're not a part of the actual location for desktop, so they don't show under desktop. Okay? So that's pretty cool. So now you know how to find out what directory you're in, how to find out what directories are available, or even just a listing of that directory is probably a better way to say it. So you see all the files and the actual folders in, in that location. Um, beyond this, uh, another what is another one that one of my coworkers had a problem with? Uh, change directory, present working directory, or CD in this case for Windows. Oh, so there's a command in Linux I talk about a lot, which is called man. Uh, man is short for manual, and it gives you a readout of everything about that particular com command that you want to that you want to learn more about windows has a very similar uh command but in this one is very it's pretty straightforward it actually is help there you go so help will actually list out all of the available commands that you can run that are built directly into windows okay 
So we have CD, which we just said here. So, and this is probably somewhere we probably could have started, right? Uh, CD. Uh, we have call. We have all these other things right here. Uh, CLS clear screen. We do that. I do that pretty often in our PowerShell. Start a new instance of command prompt interpreter, which is what command interpreter, which we're in now. We can change the color, compact display, or alters the compression of files on the NTFS partition. Copy is one we're going to talk about in just a moment. So that's how we're going to move. We're going to move one file or copy one file to another location. Now, on top of having copy, you also have should have move in here as well. Let's see. Ooh, erase. I never knew erase. It deletes one or more file. So I'm still used to Unix. Unix calls it remove rem, but here we call it erase. So we can erase the file from here. Um, also delete one or more files. So I wonder what's the difference between erase and delete. We'll have to figure it out in a second here. I like to use find stream. Okay, so not find, but find stream. It's a pretty good way to filter out based on a directory search. You could do like directory listing, but then pipe it into a find stream where you look for just a particular set of strings in that output. Very similar to the grep command in Unix. And uh, format F type. So it displays the it displays your modified file types used in file extension associations. Very useful to know. And I was looking for move. Here we go. Move. So moves one or more files from one directory uh, to another. Now there is one other thing is I want to understand is how do we rename a file? Well, look at here. Rename a file. Also can be shortened to just ren. Okay, then we also remove a directory and we can replace files. So replace files, um, I'm not really sure when to use that because to me, if you have move, uh, and rename, or well, actually copy and rename. I guess that's pretty much all you need to really replace a file. Um, well, I guess rep oh, I guess replace a file would be if you want to keep the name, but you're getting rid of the content. We could try that out. That's actually something we'll probably try out. Um, and then SC never seen this one before. Displays or configures displays or configures services. All right, so SE is how we do the service and stuff. Shut down, I've done that quite a few times. And source inputs, okay. And if you have anything, you're in chat. If you have anything that stands out to you, you want to try, let me know. Happy to do it. Oh, look at that tree. Graphically displays the directory structure of a drive or a path. Oh, we got to do that one. Okay. Um, and then what's the X copy? Copies files and directory trees. So I guess it does everything, not just the file. Okay, cool. All right, so since tree is one that we can do, let's go ahead and enter. Look at that. I think that's pretty cool. Let's go back one. Okay, so uh, one other command I wanted to show you was, I believe this works this way, right? Uh, forward slash question mark should give us more information about CD, which it does. So this is like the help op. This is the manual option specific to a command. So you have help, which lists out all of the commands, and then you use help with that command, and it gives you like a readout of how to use the command. So it's very similar to to uh, uh, to man man the manual command within Unix. So what you saw me do is a shorthand abbreviation of help with the question mark. Another way we can do this, I believe, is just type in help. No, maybe it's forward slash help. That's what it is. Actually, no. Uh, help CD, maybe? Let's see if help CD is how we do it. I'm just guessing at this point. Yeah, okay, cool. So it's help, then the name. Okay, cool. So you got to do help and then the command you want more information about, or you can do the command space forward slash question mark. Both of do the exact same thing. Uh, now the reason why I did this is because I wanted to specify this right here. Uh, the dot I wanted to show you the dot 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 specifies that you want to change 
to the parent directory. What does that mean? Well, every time you go down in the directory, you're going to the child of the parent, right? And it's so funny. When you think about technology, most of the things we do, we associate to human human being, I guess, way of living, you know, or whether it be we reference. We build things almost like we building, we're rebuilding ourselves. So most things have like a brain, a processor, right? Uh, the registry is the brain for the Windows operating system. And then you also have relationships such as child, a parent-child relationship, which we're very familiar with, you know, on different levels within the, you know, the human uh, being society, right? So they try to reference things and things that are easy for us to comprehend. So if it says you want to go back to the parent directory, you want to go to where we are currently, where it was birthed from, where it came from. So I say that because I want to show the tree command from somewhere that may have a little bit more uh, oomph to showing it, right? So this has quite a few directories. So if we do tree now, look at that. It actually goes down. It goes down, I guess, as far as it needs to. And we can kind of play around with this, right? So let's do this really quickly. We're going to do make. Where was, what was the make directory? Let me see. Uh, make dir. Okay, so that same command is in Unix. So we're going to do mdir. And you have to remember, this is not case sensitive. That means I do not have to type it as I see it on the screen. Windows will do all the other stuff on the back end to make, it, make sure it understands what I'm going for. But I'm going to do make directory, desktop. And then we're just going to do goodies. And I'm going to create this directory. Um, candy. I don't know. Let's do that. Okay. So now if I do tree, we should have a not one child, but now two children of the desktop directory. There we go. So visually seen here, desktop, goodies, and then candy. We just made that folder. All right, so this would be a good way to see what folders are available for you to copy into or to copy from when you're doing any work in the command line interface, okay? So I think that's pretty cool to keep in mind. Um, what's well, some things we do normally, right? We'll create files, and I want to do I want to do that real quick, right? So separate window, start a command. How do we create? Create a file. Let's see if we can do a uh, find string. Help and then find string create. So it creates, does it create macro somewhere in there? It didn't show me the actual command. I know now it's, I know it's in there, but that's not going to help. All right, so what else can I do? Well, I can go over to my handy dandy drive file and see what I wrote down as a note. Yes, I did a little bit of research, I'm not gonna lie, just a little bit. Um, oh yeah, we definitely gotta get into there. Um, there's the start command. So this is, I think, the one I wanna do. Open the file with a particular program. No, nope, that's not it. How do I... Where is the one where I create a file? That's special folders, uh, list, volume. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. So, one word. Let's just see if there's a way for me to. Let's open this up. Copy. And I'm gonna paste, actually I'm gonna paste it right here. Well, I'll paste it in there. Cause this is one site I wanted to show everyone. And we'll come back to it in just a second. But let's see here, how to create a file from Windows CMD. All right, so Windows command line. Oh, dude, I should have known. 
something as basic as this. Okay. So if we just do data create a file using okay, there's a FS util. This seems like a lot of work. Why do I want to put a number of bytes? Like I know what I'm gonna be I don't some of these things I, I appreciate it and I guess it's a gr great way to limit what can uh, what can happen to to limit to tell the number of bytes to put into the file or to make the file a certain size and in fact I guess that would make some sense if you if you're trying to maybe there's a file minimum I don't know where that would happen maybe it's a file minimum maybe you want to uh, bloat the file up good way to do it I guess but this is what I'm gonna stick with right this is very similar to what you do in uh, in in um, in a Unix Linux type operating system you can also just do echo so I'm gonna stick with what I know which is echo and then using the um, output so take the standard output and push it as an input into the next item provided which is the name of the file so let's go and do that all right so I'm gonna clear my screen we read about this one already so I cleared the screen and I don't think it actually clears the screen I think I'm about to scroll up can I scroll up oh no it actually does clear the screen okay cool in PowerShell for some reason I don't think it clears the screen all right so in command prompt it clears the screen so now I have a brand new screen nothing here uh, I want to now I'm in tester Bob is the location I'm currently in so I'm not in desktop it won't show up on my desktop let's do it so it shows up on my desktop what, what harm is gonna come from us putting another file on the desktop nothing at all right so if <laughs> you want to delete files all right Megan we're going to definitely get into delete files as well so let's create a file first and then we'll delete it uh, as well. And in fact, I wanted to find out the difference between delete. I'm glad you mentioned it, Megan. So I want to know the difference between delete and erase. I want to see if it does anything different. So let's go and do um, echo. And then I'm going to always do double parentheses. Uh, I'm sorry, double quotation. Um, hello, Batman. I don't know where that comes from. Came in my head, output, and uh, just because dot txt. All right, look at there. It popped up on my desktop. We are now there. And what I can do now is I can do copy just because, and I do tab to do auto completion so I don't type all the letters uh, if you just type if you hit a couple like maybe like the first few letters and hit tab it will try to locate it now I'm gonna show you something really funny about um, Windows and you know, let's do this so we're gonna copy this and we're gonna do just because just Becca okay Just Doris, and you'll see them all while I'm doing this, and then Carla. Okay, so notice what's happening here. So I did, I'm doing auto completion and I'm literally typing tab and tab over again. And Windows is actually cycling through every file that starts with that letter. Now, this is really important to understand. The reason why this could be a problem is because if you are running a script, um, well, not even running a script. It, well, yeah, if you're, running, if you're running a script and let's say you put in, I guess we could try it as well, but you put in an incomplete name, Windows will try to fill in the name the best it can. It won't just say, um, I can't remember what the, what the, what the, what the, what is it called? I can't remember 
what the attack is called when they when they leverage this. But Windows tries to auto populate and fill in your name the best it can. And part of that is because it doesn't have case sensitivity. It just reads through everything available in that directory. You give it the first letter, it'll read through everything. So I thought it was pretty cool because in Linux, if you do uh, just B, um, it's only going to populate the, um, and actually, if I, let me see here. Yeah, okay, yeah. So it did, so I put in the rest of it. If I do just B, E, C, it does just those two. But I love the fact that Windows, and I think if I do, and the best is to show you this, I just thought about it. Show you with a capital letter. But it actually wants to rewrite all of it. Um, overwrite all, no. I don't want to do yes. What does all do? No, it overwrites all of it. So anyway, if I do Carla and then Carol, let me try that one. Carol with a lowercase c. And now... See, this wouldn't happen in Unix because the case sensitivity would count Carla with a lowercase c and Carol. Uh, when I do the tab search on the first c, which I did here, I just filled in just the first c. If I stop here, it wouldn't populate. In this case, if I do a lowercase c, it would not populate Carla at all. But Windows is filling it in as a non-case sensitive uh, environment. And is actually trying to find anything that matches those letters. So that has come some of the problems you run into in Windows. I thought it was something uh, interesting to bring up is that because of the lack of case sensitivity, the naming of a file is really important. And it might be a reason why they haven't replaced. All right. So um, that being said, we want to delete some stuff. So let's find out the difference between delete and erase. So let's try to do erase. No, do delete first. Let me make sure I do it right. So do help. All right, D E L for delete. And then we have, oh, erase. Okay, so DL erase. So let's do DL just Doris. Let's delete it. All right, it goes bye bye. Now let's try doing with erase. See if there's any difference. If I look at this, I believe no, it did not go into recycling bin. That's pretty interesting. Let's see what happens if I, if I do a graphical delete, right? Go up here, right click, delete. It does go to graph. So look, that's one thing to keep in mind. If you delete from command line, it really does remove it completely. If you do it from the GUI, it shows up in your recycling bin. Mm, something to remember, right? And in fact, I think there might be a way for us to look at that again. So a little differently. Okay, so anyway, let's do a race and see what happens differently. So race, we're not gonna do Doris because Doris is gone. Let's do just Becca. All right. Okay, that is now gone. Now, maybe the difference is one can be seen in the recycling bin and one cannot. So recycling bin, Windows 10, command prompt. So how do we get there from the command prompt? Uh, nine ways to, no. Um, How to 
this the this ain't how to open it. Okay. Let's just do this, see what it does. I know I have I'm a hoarder of tabs. I do it all the time. I have like twenty, thirty tabs open. Alright, so recycling bin. Not what I want. Not what I want. Great. Start shell. Okay. How to access recycle bin from CMD. Am I going to have to? I don't want the GUI. How to open recycling bin from Windows command prompt. Let's see what super users have to say about this. I don't want to start it. Can I just do this? Can I list out? List. Okay, CMD list files and recycling bin. Recycling is a hidden file. In command prompt, type CD to navigate to recycling bin. Okay, how do we list hidden files? That's another word, another thing to keep in mind. List hidden files. How to show only hidden files in terminal? No, I want in command. No, come. Oh, Take the wrong thing. CMD list hidden files. Ooh. We'll do the trick. All right, let's try it out. Let's see if this works. So let's clear the screen. And I'm doing all this to see if there, I know it doesn't show in the recycling bin through the GUI. Maybe if you look through the recycling bin for the command prompt, it might look a little different. I don't know. Let's try it out. It doesn't hurt, right? So dir, I think it said four slash a colon h. And don't know what just happened. I'm on desktop, right? Yeah, I'm in desktop. Okay, let's make sure I follow that correctly. No, that's it. HS R. All right, let's try them all. Actually, you know what, y'all? Why didn't I remember this? Let's do the help command. And let's see. Do we have any hidden files right here? This four slash A displays files with specified attributes. So how do I use A? Oh, well, I did it correctly. Hidden files. System files. Let's try S, read-only files. Offline. OK. Um, looking at this, I think that might be all we need. Displays alternative data stream of the file. That is something something that we can dig into another day. I like looking at alternative data streams. It's something I learned when I was studying for one of my certifications. I don't do it very often, so I gotta read up one again. But I thought it's pretty I think it's pretty cool. Alright, so um Didn't do that. Nope, system didn't work and hit um, hidden didn't work either. The H. Let's 
Mimi O offline fouls? I don't think that would work, but there has to be a way to get this recycling to show up. I'm on the desktop. Okay. Oh. Nothing found. All right. Well, what? Ha oh. <sighs> it's a link to the C drive, right? So let's do this. C drive. So what I just did to go back to my C drive is. I selected, I mean, I did change directory, space, and then the letter of the drive, colon, and then backslash. That is how you go back to whatever drive, you, that's how you navigate to any drive you want to do. So now, if I do hidden files here, this should give me what I'm looking for. There we go. Okay, so now... Let's go into dollar sign recycling. Okay, so if you remember these numbers here, these are our SIGs. So each of these represent one user. 500 is for the administrator itself not the administrator account i'm oh, sorry administrator account not the type of account called administrator but the actual account administrator this is zero three zero one um you can always find out what your sid is by just typing in i know mine is zero zero is the one zero three but uh, find sid So from here, we could do it that way. WMIC is definitely a powerful thing. Uh, who am I for slash user? I got to get more into using that one. Uh, who am I slash user? So like I said, I knew I was 1003 because I worked with it enough. So touch the bob. This is a folder I want to go into next, OK? So we do that, and we don't have to actually traverse into the folder. We can actually just um, just do tab, do dir tab. Now I have two text files here. Um, this is where we can try to open a file. So now, how do I open a file? Well, in my list I had just a moment ago showed me how to do that. It is the start command. So let me see if I can figure out how to use the start command to open a file, right? So start forward slash question mark. Okay, I can do a title, path, start windows, maximize, minimize, maximize, separate. Wait, start application and wait for it to terminate. <laughs> Batch file and other parameters. Okay, so start node. Specifying node allows processes to be created in a way that leverages memory. Okay, that's beyond what I'm looking for. What else do you have for me? Nope. Okay, well, let's just try it. So start, what was that directory? We're in the recycling bin now. S2103 for slash start out. All right, cool. Uh, just Carol, look at that, just Carol. So this is the same entry we see in the GUIs. We have one other file though. Let's see what that file does. That's pretty cool. No, I have another file. I know I have another file. DIR. I want to open this one. It's a lot shorter.
Hello, Batman. <laughs> Wonder what that is. Is that just the text in the file? So let's do this. Let's change some of the text. So cool thing about the echo and using one output sign. Hello, Robin. And I'm going to do one output. I'm going to do just because. I'm in the wrong directory, if you remember. So we're going to do C drive, forward slash, forward slash. Um, is it users? Yep, forward slash tester bot. Okay. And then I add just because in here. Oh, desktop. Just because. I'm getting a ding in my ear. I don't know if you hear it or not, but it's giving a ding every time I do. So we're going to change the output for that. Then we're going to erase. Now, one thing we did find out is that the erase so far does nothing different. Uh, so now we're going to erase this same file. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay. All right. It just went bye bye. And let's see if it shows up or not at all. Uh, so DIR. Oh yeah, we did um, hidden file. That's how we do it. Hidden. Then let's go to SID twenty one. A three. <coughs> so that's the hidden file. I just want regular files now. No change at all. Now, if I do GUI Catwoman, oh, no, no, Squirrel Girl. Save it, right? Then uh, delete. Let's see what happens now. Looky there, we have two entries. So now we're figuring out how this part works. Uh, if you the recycling bin is only accessed if deleted, uh, if a file is removed from using your GUI, you can recover it. Now, if you delete directly through the command prompt, you cannot recover it as easily. Uh, it is not going to be saved in the recycling bin, which is good to know. Uh, and in addition to that, you have different files that are created every time a entry in recycling uh, shows up. Now, I know the last time we did the 96, that means this one should say, uh, what, bet? Hello, Catwoman, right? Well, hello, hello, Squirrel Girl. There we go. So the first entry is just the file name. The second entry associated to it is going to be um, is going to be the actual text inside the file or content of the file. I don't know if it works any differently with, with images, but I think it's pretty interesting to find out. So we have that done. So now we know how to do that. We show how to do co the copy command, obviously. And then let's see here. Can we move the file from recycling? Can we restore from recycling? How do we restore? And I don't think it's going to be re removed. I don't think it's going to be moved either, though. Let me see. Let's do help. Let's see if there's a restore function. And restore command. Recover. Oh, no. I don't think that's the same thing. Okay. All right. Well, I think. If we go over to our browser, we can find an answer how to restore. 
from the cycling drone. Okay, so recover deleted files using command prompt. So that is going to open a GUI. It looks like we retrieve files from recycling using command prompt. This is not what we want. Let's try it out. Let's see what happens. Because it should just open up a shell. Yep, exactly what I thought. Um, is there a way to do it from command prompt? Looks like there's a sys tool. Okay, okay, what about this one? Recover delete files from external hard drive using CMD. Type in change this letter. Uh, yeah, this is not exactly what I'm looking for. We'll recover all files in a storage device. All right, well. Let's try it out. Let's see if it works on C drive. What's the worst that can happen, right? Nothing. You just gotta restart it. Yep, that doesn't look good at all. Um, it looks like it, I'm glad I have access denied. It looks like I should have read that command a little closer. So it looks like it's doing. I gotta find out what that what that does. It looks like it does everything for everything. So no matter what the name is, no matter what the extension is, it'll run whatever task is running. And it says delete it. So pretty much recover all the deleted files, right? So I don't want to do that. Let's figure out what a trib does. Displays or changes file attributes. So archive file attributes, system file attributes. And the command we were doing is H, R, S, H, R, and S. So H is hidden files. R is read only files and S, then process matching files in the current folder and all subfolders, process folders as well. So that's essentially what we were telling it to do. We told it to find hidden, all the other stuff we just read, and then do this. And it said that. So I guess it's just automatically restores. So, oh, displays or changes. So it displays or changes the file attributes. So I guess we were displaying them all into the location. What caused it to recreate, I guess. I don't know. All right. Uh, not what I was looking for anyway. So how do we recover? How do we restore? How to recover deleted files using command prompt. I'm saying, I don't know why searching is so difficult for me, man. If you all have any tips at all that help me out with searching and get better results, please, please let me know. 
because these results, it takes me forever to find out how to do this. All right, it says, next type in this, press enter, it's different operating systems. This command may also be recycled or recycler. Uh, we know this works for us. Then type this and press enter. At last type dir and enter, then you will get all deleted files. In this way, you can easily retrieve files from using CMD. So it has to be as administrator, obviously. Okay, so let's try it. So I'm gonna close this out. I am going to do CMD, right click, run as administrator. Oh, I gotta do a password because Touch the Bob is not an administrator. And then, let's see, this should still work. So command, change directory C, and then change, then I'm gonna do a DIR recycler then, forward slash six, three. All right, there we go. We got all the files listed there. And it says to navigate to the recycling bin. And it says to run the same command, retrib from RSH. I have the S in there, H, and then asterisk dot asterisk did I okay try this way This is acting real funky now. Um, let's try it on this. Let's try. You see this? I don't know if you see on my screen, my little asterisk here. It's still on the screen. It's about, this is what I was kind of telling you before. Sometimes your prompt will get kind of crazy and it won't work right. So it's important to know how to identify where you are. And then Windows, change directory, right? CD. All right, so that being said, let's go to SID. And for some reason, it's not letting me do anything. Oh, there we go. Space SID 21 and DIR. Oh, yeah. Close. Wrong one. All right, what I just did, I, I backed out with a double dot, right? The two periods goes to the parent. And I said, go back in to the next folder, which is in 103. Now if I do this, it should work. Now let's try to be a trip. And you always have to put spaces between your parameters, okay? Now, I ran that command, came at blank, says do asterisk, forward slash S. Okay, so what happens? Oh, was I supposed to? I think I misread that. Press enter, last type this directory. I did that. Enter, then you will see all deleted files in this way. You can easily retrieve files using P CMD. I don't get that. Doesn't look like it did anything for me. Okay. Let's see if that. What does the forward slash do? Let's see. Let's 
slaves file sets out directory and all of that there. Oh, why not just do it in the directory I want it in, right? How about this? Let's do the same with trip, right? And then let's go up to forward slash little C drive. As far as a shortcut I could be doing, but let's just do it this way. C drive uses tester Bob in desktop. We're going to do DIR. No, it didn't do it. Maybe, I, you know what? This is even frustrating now. Let me see. It's talking about recovering it. And it's from the recycling bin. CMD is a great way to get deleted files. Undelete in Windows 11, 10, 8, 7, and XP. So we'll do the run command CD slash. Yep. And that I was already seen the file. Oh, you know what? Did I overlook it? Hold on. No, that's exactly what ended up happening. Yeah, that didn't. Not work. So, what are you telling me? This is so crazy. Well, just like last time, didn't work perfect the first time we tried. This is just another example of having to search around to find what you need because these are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, how to recover delete files using command prompt. Windows 10. Yeah, that's the GUI. Cool. So when FR without using Windows file recovery. The most effective way to recover deleted files in Windows 10 is using the command prompt is by using the command line based window. Here is how to use the app. After downloading the app from the Windows Store, launch it. Okay, so that's a Windows Store download. Is there an alternative? At least that one is command line based. I was hoping it has just a regular CMD. I might have to call it quits in a moment. I don't think I'm going to find this one. Okay. Anyway. So, oh, man. I'm a little upset about that. But we already know we can always just go in here and restore. Right? So that's quick and easy. Uh, well, hopefully we find uh, another option later to restore from command prompt. Um, but yeah, that is all I have on this one. The last thing I wanted to show was the set command. So I'm showing set because set is a list of environment variables that you can use to quickly navigate your system. Now, each of these entries you call it by doing the percent sign in front and the percent sign after. So, for instance, I have app data. This is routing from user to users to tester to app data and then to the roaming folder. So this is an alias, right? It rep this one entry represents this path 
or on directory, right? So you're here path. This is what people are talking about. The entire path from start to finish from the first letter to the last ending. And then so all these are listed here, right? So common program, home drive, home path, which is for me, local app data. I love this. So this is where you can view all your predefined uh, aliases for paths. And it's really important to know these because what you come across the longer you're in the industry, the longer you're in the field, you'll see a lot of these percent sign, word percent sign. And at first you'll be like, oh, what is that? But now you know. It's just a alias that plugs in. Once executed, it plugs in an actual directory to go through. So if we go, for instance, this, and then app data, uh, percent sign, see what it did? It took me into from desktop into Roman, app data Roman. I could do the same thing for local app data. So if I do CD, local app data, it'll take me to the local one. And then you can list that, look at look at what's here, OneDrive, whatever it may be, right? Programs. So I think it's pretty cool. Um there was one other thing I wanted to make sure I go over. So this I will have to go back to my handy dandy Google Drive notepad. So we're looking to set oh uh we're not we're not gonna get to net sh or net command. These are really freaking cool commands. I would tell everyone to check them out. So uh, net command, I know I use it at work to pull down credentials about the user that I'm logged in as. So if I do like net user and then um, tester for domain, which is doesn't really exist. I don't even put domain. Yeah, I don't have to do domain. Um, so I do net user tester. It gives me all the information about that user, about when they set the password, when they logged in, their user information, their name, uh, last login times right here. So I think it's pretty cool. But net can do a lot of things. Net SH does a lot of things when it comes to your network cards, such as dumping your network credentials. Uh, so if you ever forget your password, if you learn the net sh command, then you can actually dump whatever credentials are on your current Wi-Fi connections and you can write the password back down if you ever forget what it is. You can do that from any Windows machine that's on that particular network at that time. You can do a dump and then pull the password, you know, just in case your cousin comes over, you can't remember what your login is. You can do it that way. Um... We showed you set list values. That's what it is. Okay. So often you're only going to operate in the C drive. Now, if you remember on this particular machine, I created three, uh, well, two more drives, uh, which are being shared. One is shared from the Windows 11 machine. Actually, I think both are being shared from the Windows 11 machine. By the way, the drives are recognized, and the way we can list out what locations we can navigate to is the list volume, which did not work because I think it, yeah, it is called list volume. So I guess that is an additional com additional application. So let's do the WM WMIC is just built into all windows. This should give me what I need. So what it's saying here is I have a C drive, D drive, E drive, and F drive available on this machine. So if I could go to any of those, let's try E. E did not work, I think, like I said, because it is connected to D drive may work. Device is not ready. So D drive, I think, is my recovery drive. And I would have to start up my Windows 11 to access the E and F drive. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. These are useful commands I think you should always keep in, keep in hand. Um, from the beginning, like I said, um, the most important commands are CD, learning how to navigate different directories, right? Um, then also the help command, 
so you can find out what commands you can uh, you can op you can work with and then learning how to tie help into a command of interest to find out how that specific command works right and then also you have um, the copy when you copy a file you have the delete and erase which you we didn't find out anything different about it, about it yet you also have the move okay and then you have the replace right so if I do echo home path oh set let's go over set real quick I think I'm looking for a home path yeah home path okay so uh, if I do CD home path it will take me here and I can go into my desktop and then I could do clear screen and then um, echo out just echo is not going to work so I wonder why I was doing that oh I'm not tested that's why it's supposed to be and then go to desktop This is echoing out the file. Start. All right, squirrel girl. Let's say I want to replace. No file replaced. All right, so that is one thing I have to work on is how to do the replace command, but I know we could do the move command and move files around and also rename. So if you want to rename Carla, you can do just Carla into just Bobby. And there you go, it just changed on the desktop. All right, everyone, well, only a few minutes from now, it is over. This is going to wrap up pretty much our Windows exploration of the local uh, administration. And uh, like I said, I wanted to end on just some basic commands to keep in mind to help you navigate through uh, command prompt. If you know these basic ones, you at least know how to navigate the folder structure. You'll know how to uh, create a file. Uh, and how to delete files and stuff like that without having to use a GUI. So that's pr pretty much to be a great step in the right direction. Beyond this, uh, after this week, next week, we will be doing our server build and setup, and that's going to take us a few weeks, and we'll jump back into learning Linux uh, from an administration standpoint, and then after that, it'll be a completely active directory from that point forward. All right, well, I do thank, thank you all for your time. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Hope you learned at least something, saw some of the hardships I go through in trying to learn how to apply what I think should work. And uh, But that's the point of this, right? What you think should work, what people tell you should work, it doesn't really matter to you. Do it yourself. And that's why we say te trust your techno, please. Thanks, everyone. I'm off to, off to do my daddy duties. Have a good one. Good night.